Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But it's just, isn't it neat to see people come together? And uh, I love this place. I mean, I just like want to adopt everybody or them to adopt me or go on staff or whatever else because I just feel like this is home and I feel like, to your word, I just, I feel belo- I like I belong here. Amen? And isn't that a good thing to do? Just feel like you belong? Uh, I can so relate to, my wife and I can so relate to uh, celebrating like a nine-year. We celebrate our seven-year just recently of starting a church. And... For church planters, um, if, if you've been here in the last year, uh, you missed all the pain. <laughs> Can I just say that? And all the challenge. And they talked about almost quitting. Now, we quit three times a week for the first two years. I'm thinking, I'm going to give it a year. If it doesn't get better, we're quitting. Are you right with that? Yeah, a year. Like, what do you think? Let's give it another year, two years. We're still crying. Oh, God, do something. And, and I can remember those days where I would sit on the front, stand on the front row and I look at Tim and I said, don't turn around. There's nobody here. There's nobody here, you know. And, uh, and, and then, you know, but, you know, by a quarter after the hour, I mean, it, they usually start showing up. Have you noticed that, Pastor? They, they just, but I, I preached at the 8 o'clock this morning. You know, 8 o'clock is really early. I don't know. Does anybody know that? This is my people right here. When God created the heavens and the earth, he did it at 10 a.m. You, you know it's true. You know, he looked over at, you know, at the Holy Spirit and the Son and said, you know, well, let's wait. Let's give it till 10 and we'll be fine. Right? Amen? So uh, I, I love just uh, kind of waking up and I'm just starting to wake up. I want to give you a, a, a quote that I love from Lester Summerall. It goes like this. God will never give you a dream that you can accomplish on your own. We live in a, in a society, in a world that is all about the individual. It's all about everything from a selfie to look what I did. But in the kingdom of God, it's just the opposite. It flips everything on its, on its end and says, no, it's about the dreams that God put in your heart and the people that God have put, has put around you to help you accomplish a great dream. And this dream that we call today Elevate Church is a dream that started nine years ago, but it didn't start alone. And it wouldn't, couldn't be accomplished alone. It had to have people like you. And you probably underestimate the way other people see you in life. Did you hear me? We tend to underestimate the way others see us, and, and others overestimate the way we see us. So people look at us, and they go, wow, look what they, how they've got that going, and look how valuable they are. Wow, I wish I could do announcements. Who Where are you? What is your name? I love you. In the Jesus way. But you just did such a great job. But I mean, think about just that dynamic that she brought in that moment. And these musicians and these singers and and the people greeting me and serving me. and, and, And I mean, I'm just sitting there going like, this is amazing. Really is amazing. We have some good friends. Um. Uh, Bianca and uh, Matt Oltoff, and they started a church six months ago, and we had them over to our home for dinner. And it was really more of a, a you know, one of those cry sessions. I mean, that's really what we do when we plant, you know, <laughs> come on over, and, and yes, it will get better. Yeah, just hang in there, you know, and, and it's just so good to be able to, to relate. I was glad to meet a couple of guys when I came in, fa- familiar faces, who'd been here from day one. I mean, if you're here from day one or, or first year, second year, you really see a different dynamic than if you walk in today. But if you walk in today, you get to go, you know what? Now's my season. Can you say that? Yes. Now it's my season. Now I get to go, and then somewhere five years down the road, they're going to go, how long have you been here? I've been here like seven years. Wow. Yeah, I know. I paid a price so you could enjoy it. Don't ever forget me. Here's a couple of principles I want to just get started with. First one is this one. God is bigger than your problems. As a pastor, we always have that, that moment. Uh, I call it the crying lion session when people come up to you afterwards and tell you how big their problems are. Oh, my pastor, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm facing the biggest problem of my life. 
No human being on planet Earth has ever faced this. Seven billion people dwarf in scope of my problem. <laughs> and you look at them, you kind of smile on the inside and go, well, tell me about it. And they tell me, and I'm going like, that reads like one on some of the things I've heard. <laughs> you know, you just kind of, after a while, you, just, you cease to be shockable. But let me, let me ask you this. If you will start every day, if you can start every day going, God is bigger than my problems, it doesn't matter what you face, you're never going to get discouraged. You're never going to go, what am I going to do? You're going to go, what is God going to do? Can you say that? What is God going to do? Because God is bigger than my problems. He is. And when you face your problems, guess what? They diminish. They get smaller. When you run from them, they get bigger. Every time we run away from a problem, it's just looming over us. It's chasing us down. But when you face it, you go, wait a minute. I can tackle this problem. This is not too big for God. It might be too big for me, but it's not too big for God. And how about this one? This is a, a saying that I've used with my kids. I use in my church, and it's so good. 90% of what you worry about will never happen. 10% will. But with that 10% in God, you can take care of it. But you think about all the things you're going, like worst case scenario. Worst case scenarios never happen. Okay, you, you, somebody's going to go, I know a guy, worst case, it did. Okay, that guy doesn't get to play in this game. 90% of what you worry about. So now all you do is you strengthen yourself for the 10% that will. How do I prepare myself? I prepare it by saying God is bigger than all of my problems. And here's the other truth that you do, and it's this. God invests in your future. God is investing in your future. You know what faith is? Faith is reaching into the future and pulling it back into the present. So that you live your life, you're calling those things that are not as though they are. You've got to say it so when it's not so in order for it to be so. That's faith. So God is investing in your future. He's always out there planting seeds out in front of you. You're coming along and going, wow, look at this harvest. Look what's going on here. Well, God was doing that for you. God was, has already arranged people in your future to bring you to the next level that you don't even know. God is creating circumstances that you're going to go, this is amazing. How did this happen? Uh, I sent this to my wife the other day. I said, you've got to look at this. We, we go to Europe uh, about every other year, and we, do a, we teach European history, art, philosophy, and religion, okay? And we stay in a villa. It's just like a dream job, all right? For a week, we take a fr about 10 couples. We go to Europe, and we just have a blast together. And we were in France a number of years ago. I took a picture of this house, and I said, I'd love to have a house like this. And, and I took this picture. It had this massive view and all this. And then another friend of ours had a house out in the desert. And I said, look at the inside of this house. It's so gorgeous. I wish I could have a house like this. You know? and, I, and I was thumbing through. I was trying to find pictures, trying to find some skinny pictures of me. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I need a skinny picture. I went to the cabinet the other day, and I pulled out a, my wife had a, a, a bar, so, you know, one of those, you know, like protein bars? It says, think thin. I said, I can think thin all I want. I'm still fat. <laughs> this is not doing me any good to think thin. I got to be honest with myself. No, you're, you eat too much, Phil. Stop it. <laughs> Go eat some fruit. But anyway, I take this picture. I'm thumbing through them, and I send them to my wife. I said, will you look at this? This house looks like our house, the shape of it from this hill. The hill looks like our hill. And then I, and, then I, and look at these pictures of this house inside. It's the same tile. It's the same woodwork. She said it's even the same table. Now, now watch this. I was just sitting there going, wouldn't it be great if I'd love to have a house like this, love to have a view like this. God is able to do even more then you ask or think. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was asking. God says, you haven't seen anything yet. If you will walk with me, stay with me, align yourself with me, I'm going to do beyond anything you could think. Think your greatest thing. I'll do more. That's what God wants to do. Also, God increases, watch this, the level of risk. What you have to risk now is nothing compared to what you're going to have to risk tomorrow. Starting a church is a risk, but guess what? We got no payroll. We got no building. We got no equipment. We really don't have much risk. If this thing fails, nobody's going to notice. Amen? All of a sudden, you start moving down this journey, and all of a sudden, you got people. You got people, that, they're waiting on their paycheck on Friday. Where's my paycheck? Well, can't make payroll this week. No, it's risk. It's risk. And risk is what keeps you alive. 
I mean, nothing. Is anything more boring than taking no risk? What do you do in your life? I just really play it safe. You know, I, I, I don't drive more than two miles from home. I mean, can you imagine living your life like that? It's kind of like your, your high school student saying, what are you going to do with your future? And he says, you know, Dad, I got it pretty good here at home. <laughs> you know, uh, you let me borrow the car. Give me 20 bucks for taking the trash out. I sleep in late. Mom makes me breakfast. You know, I am think I'm just going to stay here. And you're going to have a serious Jesus talk with this boy. And you're going to say, that ain't going to happen. Have you heard of the U.S. Army? (laughs) Something's going to change here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to cultivate your inheritance. You have an inheritance. When Tammy and I were first married, I used to have this funny thing. I'd go out to the mailbox, and I said, today the check is coming. And she said, what check? And I said, the check from the the relative we don't know that passed away and left us millions of dollars. (laughs) Because we were so poor, we just, I mean, that hope kept us going. Every day, I would, yeah, not here today, but it's coming tomorrow. Hey, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that because guess what? God has an inheritance check for you. You can cash every day of your life. You can draw on the bank of heaven today. You can say, God says, here's your provision, here's your gift. Because every problem you have, God always, always has a provision before you have a problem. If you study scripture, they're walking into a problem that God already has a provision for. And that's true for all of us. Let me take you to the scripture. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Do I want to understand the kingdom of heaven? Then it's like a man traveling to a far country. I'm on a journey. That's what I'm doing. I'm traveling. Who called his servants and delivered goods to them. He said, okay, guys, I'm going away. And this is the father. I'm going away, but I'm going to give you everything you need. And I want you to steward it really, really well. And, and it kind of is unspoken here, but I'm going to reward you in the end. I'm going to reward you in the end. So you see, if you look at your life, you are surrounded by key people. I want you to look to your right and your left and tell that person you are a key person. Now let me ask you something. Did you mean it? Isn't I've noticed this in life. Isn't it unusual that sometimes the, the most profound things can come from the most unlikely source? There's some people that I find annoying. Can I just be honest? I mean, I'm just being annoying. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm so I love them, but they're annoying. They come up to me and they're just they're like plugging in the circuit, draining me, and I'm going like, Jesus, 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 this guy's come back now or take him to do something. And then they'll say something. I go, whoa, where'd that come from? And I'll walk away or God will go, you think you're better than them, don't you? Well, I would admit it to you, God, but I was kind of thinking that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I like them better because they're sincere because they're real. And I walk away go, I learned so much from this annoying person. God, bring me some more annoying people. <laughs> but isn't it true? A little kid can walk up to you, say something, you go like, wow, where did that come from? Key people all around you. Do not underestimate anybody that you surround yourself with, that you run into, or any circumstance you have in life. Because guess what? God is arranging people and circumstances for a reason. And God reveals your future one step at a time. People say, well, I want to get a 20-year goal. You can have a 20-year goal. Many of the plans of man, God says, go ahead and make your plans, but I will direct your your path. In other words, I'm going to go ahead and get you on the right path, but you make plans because it's good for you, and you'll get a vision of it. But remember, it's ultimately up to me. So I'm going to take your step. One step at a time, God's revealing to me more and more about my future and what's going to happen. I just have to be smart enough, spiritually attuned enough to see it when it's in front of me and not miss out on it. Okay, God's faith in you enlarges your faith in God. Do you realize God has faith in you? He does. He trusts you. He created you in his image. He said, you are a magnificent creation of mine, and I trust you. Now, will you just use what I gave you? Will you use it faithfully, what I gave you? 
You know, here's Jesus. He's got 12 disciples, right? One of them's a traitor, Judas. Three of them are in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And eight of them are along for the ride. That's the rule of 12, the principle of 12. You'll find it in your own life. In your life, take 12 people, and uh, one of them's going to betray you. Three of them are going to be in your inner circle, and eight are going to be along for the ride. Now, don't try to find the one right now. <laughs> don't look over and go, uh-huh. It's you. I knew it. Because remember, even Peter was a traitor in a moment in his life when he denied the Lord. So be careful. Don't prejudge them. Multiply beyond reasonable expectations. Do you know that that you can, uh, in the kingdom, you, you work by multiplication, not by addition? I mean, a step out of the boat to walk on water wasn't exactly an addition. It was a multiplication, wasn't it? I mean, it was a big leap. Whenever you take big leaps, you grow quicker. So if it feels comfortable, it's probably not very risky and pretty safe. Would you agree? You have to get outside your comfort zone in order to feel the risk. You say, well, I think this is what I think we can accomplish. Okay, so then let's, let's multiply that times 10. What? I don't feel comfortable with that. Good. Well, we are, we're on something here. If we're uncomfortable with it, we're on to something here. So let's just take and multiply it because God works by multiplication. Be fruitful and multiply. It's a principle throughout the kingdom. Let me give you a scripture. Matthew 25, verse 15 and 19. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. It's interesting. There's nothing in the text that says the guy with two goes, hey, how come? See, he wasn't living the entitled generation. Why don't I get five? Every kid should get a trophy. Hey, I, li- I grew up in an era where one guy was a winner. Everybody else was called losers. <laughs> right? That's what shaped me. That's why I'm damaged goods today. All right, amen. <laughs> to another one, to each according to his own ability. Oh, so I'm going to give you five because I think you're going to steward this well. I'm going to give you two because you're going to do this well. One, you're going to do this well. Okay? It doesn't mean that, that they're not all important in the kingdom. It's just that God recognizes certain things in us. You know, if God said, go sing at Elevate Church, the pastor would close the doors because I sing so bad. I don't have that gift in it. Everybody here has a gifted area you want to use. All right. And immediately he went on a journey, and then he would receive five talents, went and traded them, and made another five talents. That's pretty good, right? So my wife reminded me of a story. Our son, Josh, who's actually preaching in our church today, and he uh, started a church in San Diego called Existence Church about 15 years ago, and then about three or four years ago, transitioned into uh, three different software companies that he owns. And he's doing some amazing things. I mean, stuff that blows our mind. He, d- he does software contracts for GoPro, Kaiser Hospital, K1, I mean, uh, K-Love Radio, Air One. He just recently got a contract with the United Nations. That's kind of impressive for a kid who couldn't pick up his socks. But let me tell you what he did have. So he said to his mom one morning, he said, make me two sandwiches. You know, he's going off to grade school, make him two sandwiches. So she makes him two sandwiches. He comes home with a new pair of Air Jordans. Now, we didn't, couldn't afford Air Jordan tennis shoes. But he got, came home with a pair. Where'd you get that? I traded him. Traded the sandwich. And so, no, <laughs> nobody <laughs> trades a sandwich for Air Jordans. You're the lion or you're a crook. Something's going on here, but this ain't right, right? Tell me the story. So he says, well, the first change I made was for a Bic lighter. Okay, then the Bic lighter. Well, there were multiple things that followed in suit all the way up to the Air Jordans. He comes home with a brand new pair of Air Jordans, but it started with an extra sandwich. Now, he has a gift to trade. Would you agree? Right? Don't do business with him. (laughs) He calls you up, hang up. You're going to lose. That's all I'm telling you. Well, that night, there's a knock on the door. Mom, wanting the Air Jordans back. Well, we can't undo this transaction. How do you undo the transaction? You've got to go, you go talk to the guy that had that, 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 and bring it all back. We'll get it back to the Bic lighter, but we want the sandwich. If the sandwich is consumed, the deal is consummated. I think this is that guy. I think this guy's Josh right here. He had five. He got five more, all right? And he made another five talents. And guess what? What do you think the master said when he came home with five more? I don't think it was like, well done, good and faithful. That sounds like 
the Bible, right? Right? I mean, it's good. I'm just saying it sounds like the Bible. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think he goes, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you made five more? Five. You doubled. You doubled. I'm firing all the other salesmen. You're my guy. I want you to be in training class. You're going to be doing webinars. You're going to be taking this thing all around the world. Because if you had a salesman who came to you and said to you, hey, I just closed uh, five of the biggest deals in the history of the company, what do you think that boss would say? Well done, salesman. <laughs> this guy, God was excited. Excited. But then look what it says here. And also likewise, one to receive two, gain two more. And he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Let's all say boo. 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 If you hide what you have in the ground, you get a boo. You get a boo. That's not what you're supposed to do. You weren't designed to do that. You were designed to multiply. Say, I was designed, I was designed to, to multiply. multiply. Amen. Okay, and after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, um, we're not going to tell you what happened to the guy with the one. You can read it yourself and find out, but God wasn't real happy with him. But God gives to multiply. So God gives you stuff so you can multiply it. God gives you uh, this gift that you have, you'll multiply that gift. God gives you love, multiply that love. God gives you a heart of a servant, then you just be a great servant. And you help others be a great servant. You, you start to reach out and say, how do I take my gift, my passion, my stuff inside of me and multiply it for the kingdom of God? Because guess what? You're happiest when you are working that way in the kingdom of God. You go, like, I feel so good. I'm exhausted. I mean, I watch people, they serve at a conference or something we have, and, and they're, they're closing the door and their eyes are almost closed. I go, how was it? It goes, great, Pastor. But i got to get some rest. They're so happy doing it. Because you, you, you feel like I have purpose in my life. Let me take you to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It says, give and it will be given to you. If you don't give, it won't be given. Just stop and let that principle sink in. People want to receive so they can give. God says you give and it will be given to you. I can't expect anything from God unless I first invest in God. I have to sow in order to reap. Amen. And if I sow, I'm going to reap. And I'm always going to reap later. I'm always going to reap more. Amen? Okay, so I'm going to sow. If I'm going to reap. I'm going to reap more. I'm going to reap later. And the harvest is always going to come in a great way. You don't know how that harvest is going to come, but you know it's going to come. I uh, was in my first church pastoring, and I'd only been saved about two years, so I really didn't. All I knew, South Louisiana, all you really know in South Louisiana is if you can scream and quote Bible, you're a good preacher. All you got to do, if you can sweat, it's added bonus. <laughs> and I remember this uh, guy who, was, who had been in the church for years, he came up to me, he said, you know, uh, Pastor, everybody in the church ties. And I said, I was smart enough to know this wasn't true. And I said, no, I, I don't really think everybody in the church gives 10% of their income. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, they do. I said, really? He said, yeah, some bring it to church and others God goes and gets it. <laughs> we, had a, we had a Pontiac car. Grand Prix, we had two babies while we were in seminary, and we really were poor as can be. And there was an old redneck, and he really was. If you look up redneck, his name was next to it. <laughs> Worked in the paper mill, and uh, he was very, very good with um, four-letter words. He was just an expert. And he'd come over, and he'd say, Preacher, how many miles you got on that car? And I said, about 70,000. I mean, how many times you change the brakes on him? I said, I never changed the brakes. Original car. I mean, it's bought, bought the car new. It's original brakes. And he goes, looking at me like I'm stupid. And I go, I never thought about it, you know, and I don't have money for him. He goes, I'm coming over tomorrow. I'm jacking it up. So he ja he's there at 5 o'clock. I mean, what? who does that? Who gets up at 5 o'clock and jacks up your car? Jacks him up. He's got the brakes off. I walk out there with a cup of coffee about 7. <laughs> My Gucci slippers. He goes, how many miles did you say you got on this? It's about 70. I'm going to go look at the other wheel. He pulls it off, looks at it. How many miles? 70. I said, he goes, I don't understand it. I said, your brakes are good. And I understood something about Malachi 3 where he stops the devourer from my life. He extends. Remember in the wilderness, the, the children, they wandered in the wilderness, their shoes never wore out. You see, there's more than one way to experience increase in your life. 
There's more than one way to do greater things in your life. When you walk with God, God finds ways to bless you that you never would have even thought of. Man, if you'd have thought of them, amen? You know why? So he gets the credit, amen? All right, so look what it says. He's going to give it to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, he will put into your bosom. Now look at this. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back. He says, you're going to measure this much. Okay, I'm going to measure it back to you. But I'm going to multiply. I don't even know what this means. Have you ever read this and go, I don't know what this means. Good measure, I get that one. Press down. Okay, I don't know. Why are you pressing it down? Shaking it together, I get it. I was sitting there watching during worship. Have you ever noticed Christians, they, they bounce this way? I noticed Jews bounce this way. I mean, what's that all about? Do you know, do you want me to tell you what happens? Do you know why Jews, when they worship at the wall and why they memorize the Torah, why they do this? Because they found that your memory is improved with rhythm. So a child by the, in an Orthodox church, by the t- Orthodox uh, synagogue, by the time he's 12 years old, he will have memorized the Torah. And they found that this right here, just doing this, because there's a rhythm. There's tie, see, everything is tied to a rhythm. So we go this way. We go this way. They go this way. But there's something to it, right? When you read your scripture, if you will do it, stand it up. Read your scripture. If you pray, you'll stand up. You know, if you fall down and lay before the Lord in prayer, you'll go to sleep. But if you stand up... <laughs> Amen, right? I remember reading books when I was in, in, in school, you know, and I go, these guys would lay before the Lord and pray. I said, I'm doing that. They'd get up at 4 a.m. I'm doing that. I'm laying before, I'm waking up at 6 o'clock. What happened, you know? I'm sleeping on the floor for two. My roommate looks at me, what's wrong with you? I said, praying before the Lord. He said, you were snoring before the Lord, dude. <laughs> Ain't no praying going on in your life. you got to be kidding me. All right. So he's going to measure back. So what happens is when you start to honor God in your giving, when you start to bless God in everything you just give back, give back, give back, give back, you see, nobody in life was ever honored for how much they kept back. We, we remember the generous people in our life, don't we? The person who sacrificed for us, the person who gave for us, the person who, who just was, was released everything they had. What God's going to do is he's going to provide an opportunity. So God provides opportunity to further his kingdom through you. God says, I can trust you. I can trust you. I can remember so many times in my life where, as you know, before I was saved, I mean, but before I was married and then after I was married, where we just, we sacrificed, we looked at each other and said, we don't even understand what we're doing here. We're going to do this. We're going to give back, God. Just going to give back. Just give back. And God always came through. Why can I trust him with my salvation? I can't trust him with anything else. Can God really take, keep me from hell and take me to heaven, but he can't help me pay my bills? He's got a bigger paycheck than I do. He's okay. Let's just summer all again. Champions are a rare breed. How many of you want to be a champion? Yeah. Huh? Come on. You've got to raise your hand. Champions don't go, nah, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to try it one more time. All right. Put pressure on. If somebody next to you is not raising their hand, you look at them and say, you are a loser. (laughs) Got it? Ready? Champions, raise your hand. Okay, champions are a rare breed. They see beyond the danger. Losers go, it's just too dangerous. I don't think we should go there. I'm a little worried. What if I don't come home? What will people think? Nobody's thinking about you anyway. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Champions see beyond the dangers. Beyond the risks, beyond the obstacles, and beyond the hardships. They go, we're going for it. What if we fail? Then we'll try again. What if we fail twice? We'll try again. Just don't quit when things go wrong as they sometimes will and the road you're trudging is all uphill and the funds are low and the debts are high. Rest if you must, but don't you quit. Often this goal is nearer than it seems to the faint and faltering one who learned too late how close he was to the golden crown. So rest if you must, but don't you quit. Don't quit. Design your life around your future, not your past. Take your life and go, I'm going to build my life around my future. Why would I build it around my past? Well, I tried that. It didn't work. So I'm not going to try it again. Let me tell you something. I tried church and it didn't. wasn't that good. Okay, it hurt me. Hey, everybody hurts you. Restaurants hurt me. (laughs) I go in a restaurant, I pay a big bill, I get bad food, bad service. They hurt me. I didn't quit eating. Look at me. (laughs) 
Leviticus 4.38, the fat belongs unto the Lord. <laughs> Amen? Now, that is burning fat. I don't know about hanging fat, but anyway. <laughs> hey, what's your future? I'm going to build my life around my future. That's where God is. He's in my future. Yeah. I step into my future, step into my future, go, look, look what God has for me. If I'm back here just hiding, God, don't feel good. God says, where are you going? I'm getting away from my future. Too risky, too scary, right? You got to do something that scares you. Have you done something that scares you lately with the kingdom? This scares me. I don't know if I'm going to do this. Just try it. What's the worst thing that can happen? They could kill me. Okay, you'll go to heaven. <laughs> Ain't all bad. Matthew 25. So he who had received five talents came and brought back. The five talents, Lord, we delivered. Uh, the five, you gained five more talents. Look at this. This is so good. Besides them, the Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful of a few things. I'm going to make you ruler. Faithfulness in little things makes you rule over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Joy is something you enter, enter into. It's not something you have. It's you enter into it, and joy possesses you. My joy do I give unto you, Jesus said. Not my joy. Uh, not as the world gives, but my joy do I give unto you that your joy might be made full. It's the word pleroma. It's the same word fullness, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Joy is going to be bubbling out of you, bubbling out of you. Matthew 25, 23, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents. This guy's excited. I got two. The guy had five. He's not even worried about the guy. Five. I got two. I got two. I, look what I did. His Lord said unto him, well done. Says the same thing. You good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Same thing. You're going to get to be a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You see, God releases your future through you. I remember praying for, set, for tires when we were first married. God, I just need a new set of tires. I never saw tires fall from heaven. Prayed for tires. Watch out. Go inside. They're going to be dropping. But I have had people come up to me and say, hey, I noticed you need some new tires. Could I help you out? See, God works through you. God designs your future through you and through the people you surround yourself with. God owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. Silver and gold are all his, says the Lord. I've never seen a church that just opened up a big funnel on the roof and God started pouring coins into it. <laughs> I'd like that, though. If we could figure that one out, we'd be okay. <laughs> Amen? But what I have found is somebody walk up to me and go, you know what, I just, I'm so blessed. My life has changed. I, is, what can I do for you, pastor? What can I do for this church? How can I, how can I fuel this future? I'm going to tell you a church planting story that um, means a lot to Tammy and I. We were about a year into this, and we we're, our church is in an area where there's just not, like yours, not many properties that are designed or could be used as a church. Not, there's not like industrial, commercial buildings. It's just very, very difficult and challenging to do that. And finally, this one building opened up in a business park. And uh, I was so excited, and we, we put an offer on it. We put $100,000 down in this, on this, this building. And we just started praying. We just knew God was doing all over this. And so we started calling banks to get a loan. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you we called exactly 110 banks we, had exact, we even talked to loan, loan sharks with ties on, all right? But we, we called 110 banks, and we had 110 no's. They said, no, thank you very much. Call us in three years when you have financials. Call us when you have more stability. Call us, call us, call us, call us. And we didn't know what we were going to do. And I got up on a Sunday morning, and I said, uh, we were meeting in the theater at the time, Edwards Theater. I mean, there's something about doing church when people are eating nachos and popcorn. <laughs> And I'm not lying. That's what they're doing. I'm going to a guy, and I go, seriously, dude? And he goes, I got up on that day, and I said, I said to the church, I said, we need $2.5 million if someone here would like to loan it to us or give it to us. And everybody started laughing. Like, you know, like, like I got $2.5 million, right? And they started laughing. And, I, and for me, I'm not trying to make fun here. I'm trying to build a church. I said, hey, I'm not joking. And then I got in the pastoral mode, and everybody quieted down. I said, serious, I need two and a half million dollars. If you have that and you could loan it to us or give it to us, would you see me after the service? Guy I didn't know walked up to me and he said, hey, I'll loan you the two and a half million dollars. Now, I'm feeling like Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. 
before the two and a half million told me so right here. I'm just, I'm in it. I'm going, this is, God, this, you, you, your servant has finally been honored here in this moment. And I'm driving home from a men's Bible study a couple of weeks later, and I get an email from this guy. Doesn't even call me, just an email. And he says, Pastor, I want to let you know I can't loan you the two and a half million dollars, but I wanted to give you enough time to go out and find a loan. That's six weeks from closing. Well, I already called 110 banks. Unless I, unless I practice armed robbery, we ain't buying this building. You know what I mean? This is just something not going to happen here. And I started laughing. I read it, and I started laughing. I called Tammy, and I started laughing. I called our board members. I started laughing. They said, it's not funny. And I said, no, it's hilarious. It's hilarious because only God could engineer this something as goofy as this. Guys got the two and a half was going to loan you the two and a half, six weeks out, reneges on it. So here's what happened. So Tammy and I proclaimed a 21-day fast in our church. We said we're going to fast for three things. We're going to fast for $2.5 million, for $200,000 in additional money we needed for to do the remodel, and to pull all the permits on a Monday. I got down to eight days. We got down to eight days before we're closing, and I couldn't even find a nickel in a couch. I had no loan, loan applications out there. I had nobody that was willing to do anything. Tammy reminded me of a friend of ours. We called him. We said, you know of anybody that wants to make money on their money? And they said, uh, call this guy in Amarillo, Texas. We called him. He said, no, I can't help you out, but call this guy in Amarillo, Texas. We called this guy in Amarillo, Texas. And that's on a Monday. We're going to close on the next Monday. I don't even have an application. I said, hey, we need to borrow $2.5 million. Think you'd help? Yeah, I might be able to. And can you send me an app? Well, I took off early today. I'll send it to you tomorrow. Now we're down to Tuesday. Now, this guy's in Amarillo, Texas. Things move slow there. I'm in Orange County. I'm already wound up like a spring. I said, okay. He sent it to me. I fire it back. Wednesday, I call him and go, how's it going? He said, well, the junior loan committee approved your loan. The word junior concerns me. <laughs> Is there a senior loan committee? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Are they mean today? No, they're going to meet tomorrow. That's Thursday. Thursday, I said, I'm supposed to close on Monday. He said, yeah, I know. I'm hungry. I'm like 16th day of the fast, 17th day of the fast. I'm mad. When you fast, you got to get mad. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like you're spiritual. All right. Thursday, he calls me. He says, I got good news and bad news. I said, what's the good news? No, I said, I said, give me the bad news first. He said, the bad news is we can't close on Monday. And there's good news in this story? Yeah, we're going to close tomorrow. Now, 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 listen to this. Thank you for your premature clap, but wait. Because <laughs> I'm going to give you something to really clap about. So he said, we were looking at your loan, and we don't think $2.5 million is enough, so we put another 200000 in it. Now, he didn't know what we were fasting for. So we put another, two, if that's okay. We closed on Friday. We pulled the permits on Monday, and we did our coal remodel on our building in 120 days. And we did it for $40 a square foot. Now, who gets the glory? First story, who would have got the glory? Probably the guy. It was too easy. If it's too easy... Watch out. Everything in God's kingdom works from the bottom up, from the inside out. It's never easy. It just seems like it is because it comes all at once. But somebody was praying. Somebody was working. Somebody was planning. Somebody was thinking. Somebody was connecting. Somebody, 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 because you can't do your dream alone. And that's true for this church. It's true for you and your family. It's true for corporately, all across, in every corporation in America. You can't do anything alone. Let me give you a final quote here. When you align your thinking with the kingdom, when you align your thinking with the kingdom, you release all the promises and the provisions of God. So it starts with a mindset. My mindset is a kingdom mindset. When I get a kingdom mindset, I don't, I'm not talking about being perfect here, guys. Because last I looked, nobody in this room was perfect. Amen? Okay, so a kingdom mindset. I'm going to think like the kingdom. What's going to happen is God will start to release promises and provisions in your life. 
and you'll just see this flow. It'll be just like a, like a momentum rolling down the hill. It's just like there's a ball rolling down the hill. There's a momentum, and it starts to roll, and you start to say, wow, I'm feeling the flow. I'm seeing what God is doing. Look at what God is doing. You see, and if you're on this other side over here and you're in inertia, I don't mean to call you guys the inertia people, but if you're on the other side over here and inertia, you got like, how do I get this thing going? How do I get this thing? Once you get this ball going, hey, can I tell you right now, Elevate Church has got momentum. Doesn't it? I mean, I can tell you, hey, I can tell the difference from last time I was here. I mean, it feels different, right? You know why? Because guess what? A year from today, it's going to feel even better. A year from now, even better, even better. More momentum, more momentum. You're going to go, and guess what? You know what's going to happen? Because individually, you're getting momentum. You are. Amen? All right, let me, let me just tell you how the momentum starts. It starts with a step of faith into the kingdom of God. That's called salvation. That's called being born again. That's calling going from darkness into light, from death into life. I, I want to I give that invitation to you right now. Because every person who has come into the kingdom has come through a new birth, a birth experience. There was a day and a time that they were born again. And here's how it works. It works in the sense that it's my sincerity and my faith extended toward what God has said. If I'm sincere sincerely looking for God and seeking after God, God meets that expectation with my faith. And he says, I'm going to bring you into my kingdom. So I'm going to model something. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would. I'm going to model a prayer, and you can pray this out loud. In fact, I would just encourage you, you to pray it out loud, even if you say, I know the Lord. Pray it out loud for the encouragement of those who may not yet be sure that they know the Lord. And, uh, and then it, it just makes life a little bit easier. So it goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I know you love me. I know I am a sinner, but I know you love sinners. You died on the cross to take away all my sins. You were put in a tomb, and you rose from the dead to give me new life. And here's where the sincerity and faith comes. Lord Jesus, save me. If that, was set, if that was spoken with sincerity and faith, God did exactly what he said he would do. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Great promise, amen? Amen. amen. Now, if that was your prayer, just in your own words, would you just thank him? All right, we stand or sit, just thank him. Pastor, I'm going to ask you to come up and, and say a few words. And yeah. How many can say thank you to Pastor Phil for that amazing message? That's such a word and season for us. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.